copyrighted program created by the Rio Grande Oil Company. Calling all cars, attention all cars, attention all Yuma County Sheriff's cars. Broadcast 133, missing person report. Jack Hayden and Ralph Hart, prospectors, are missing from their ranch near Faust. That's all. Tonight's crime occurred in Arizona, that land of wide open spaces, of long desert roads. Law enforcement officers covered great distances in their cars, so the gasoline they use must consistently produce greater mileage. Speed and power, too, are important. From the Sheriff's Office of Maricopa County, the largest county in Arizona, comes this statement. We've tried a lot of different gasolines. Last year, we decided Rio Grande Crack was the gasoline that gave us the greatest mileage. So, we specified it exclusively for all Maricopa County emergency cars. Our year's use proved that Rio Grande Crack was not only the most economical gasoline we could buy, but was also faster and more powerful. So, this year, we've renewed our contract. So, in Arizona's largest county, wherein reside approximately half the population of that great state, we find convincing evidence that Rio Grande Crack gasoline is more economical for miles. And in the congested traffic of big cities like Los Angeles, Oakland, Berkeley, we find police in emergency cars using Rio Grande Crack because it is the fastest, most powerful gasoline money can buy. Every motorist who will make a test will discover the reason why Rio Grande Crack powers more emergency cars wherever it is sold than any other brand. It is because Rio Grande Crack never fails to give smoother, faster, and more miles for your money. It is our great pleasure to welcome to Calling All Cars, Sheriff T.H. Newman of Yuma County, Arizona. Sheriff Newman. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm honored that tonight the Yuma County Sheriff's Office joins the distinguished list of law enforcement bodies to export have been selected by Calling All Cars for radio demonstrations. The territory which we patrol in Yuma County is indeed the rugged, but not quite so wild west. We are equipped with the most modern type of law enforcement equipment, fast cars, teletypes, record view, row, and so on. But when we encounter a crime such as the one we are about which you will hear in a moment, then it is the backcountry work and doesn't differ much from the kind of work the gun-toting sheriffs of the old days were called upon to perform. It isn't strange, however, that crimes such as this are ones that are encountered by eastern criminals who will think they are can hop in a car or on a horse or in an automobile and disappear over the hill, just as they have seen in, this, in the movies. This is no longer so. For we have automobiles, too. And there is the telephone and telegraph, speeding the message of their crime faster than they can travel. They are playing a sucker's game, just as those boys did. No matter how rugged the country or how remote the spot, the criminal leaves his trail, and the law is sworn to follow it. In the end, the criminal is bound to lose. January 1933. On a cold winter's afternoon, three men sit in a hall bedroom in a midtown rooming house in New York City. They are chief tenderloin sports, members of the legion of drifters which line Broadway's curbs, believers in the creed that only saps work. For today is too cold and slushy to ogle the ankles of chorus girls in front of the Austin. So they sit wasting the commodity of which they have an abundance, time. On the ice strewn bed, Dan Connell and Bill Doughty play a listless game of double solitaire while Lou Douglas idly scans the morning paper in the failing afternoon light. 
Suddenly, his eyes fall upon an item tucked away in the financial section. He snaps out of his lethargy with a jerk. Hey, you guys, get a load of this. What? Piece in the paper here. I read that paper. There ain't nothing in it. Oh, yes, there is. Listen to this. The Consolidated Quartz Corporation of America announced yesterday the purchase of the Good Hope Gold Mine from Jack Hayden, hard rock miner who first prospected the property 15 years ago. The Good Hope is located in Yuma County, Arizona, near Bouse. Whatever. Come on, Bill. Keep your mind on the game. Wait a minute, you mugs. This is more important than that card game. I know this guy, Hayden, see? Remember when I was out in Arizona a couple of years ago? Well, I worked for him then. I repeat, whatever. Just this. Hayden told me that the mine was producing enough to give him a living. And just as soon as he hit the real pay dirt, he was going to sell out and quit. Well, he hit pay dirt and he sold out. So what? This. Hayden's a funny old bird with a lot of screwy ideas. And the screwiest idea he has is this. He don't trust banks. I don't trust banks. I don't trust nobody with my money. I want it around where I can keep an eye on it, Ralph. Hey, where'd you ever get so sour on banks? Ever since we started mining together more than ten years ago, you had an unholy terror of banks. I don't understand you, Jack. Never had no trouble with banks myself. Well, I read the papers. I know what these high finance sharks do with other people's money. They swindle you. That's what they do. And what can you do about it? Nothing. Ah, oh, quit talking. Have another cup of coffee. Well, all right. Yes, just will. Uh, I got to say one thing. Ten years we've been living in this cabin out here in the desert, and I don't know yet where you keep your money hid. And you never will. It ain't safe to trust no one, not even an old friend like you when it comes to money. Well, all right, have it your own way. Wherever you hide it, it's safer than it would be in a bank. You hide it so darn good. Hey, hey, listen, Ralph. What's that? Huh? What? Hey, I thought I heard a car coming. Yeah, it does sound like it. Well, why don't you open the door and see who it is, well, don't you? You expecting someone? No, I ain't expecting no one. Well, well, who is it? You can't tell. Strange, you think. Hello there. Hello. Guess you don't remember me, Lou Douglas? Lou Douglas? Well, I'll be a son of a gun. Hey, Jack, it's Douglas. Douglas? Douglas who? Hello, Jack. Where's your memory? Don't you remember back a few years I was here? No! Well, what in the world are you doing out here? I want you to meet a couple of friends of mine, engineers from Consolidated Quartz. This is Mr. Hayden and Mr. Hart, Mr. Dowdy. And this is Dan O'Connell, Mr. Hayden and Mr. Hart. Oh, 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 oh. Mr. Dowdy and Dan here want to look over the Good Hope Mine. Their firm sent them out to make a few preliminary assays before they start production. Well, I'm glad to have visitors. We, we don't see many people out this way. Come on in sit down. Thanks. Not much of a place, but I think you can find a place to sit, <laughs> if you don't mind hard chairs. Don't worry <laughs> about these fellas, Hayden. They're regular. How about it, fellas? Yeah, sure. Uh, how long are you figuring on staying around, Mr. Dowdy? Oh, just as long as it takes us to make our investigations and such. Shouldn't be very long. You knew I didn't own the mine anymore, didn't you, Lou? I heard something about your having sold out. Must have hit it at last, eh? Yep, yep, did. Hit pay dirt and turned right around and sold out. Save all the trouble of working the mine myself. You, uh... <clears throat> You got a good price for it, Mr. Hayden? Uh, sure. <laughs> Think I would have sold it if I hadn't? Of course I got a good price for it. <laughs> I suppose you've invested your money by now. Got all over those silly ideas of yours about banks and things you used to talk about. Silly ideas? Silly I Say what's silly about them. Say, if you come out here to sell me something, you might as well get over the idea. I ain't in the market for nothing. We don't want to sell anything. Just wondering what you've done with all your ideas, that's all. Well, you can't never tell. You might have tried to sell me something. Say, um, not to change the subject or anything, but where does one sleep around here? Is there a hotel or anything near? A hotel? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. Nearest hotel is in 
Bow City and that's 30 miles back the road. Uh, Mr. Doughty isn't used to the great outdoors. Uh, that is in this part of the world. I still want to know where we bunk. Well, if you don't mind being a little cramped, I imagine you can all put up here with us for a while. We don't want to put you to any trouble. Of course, we uh, have a store of foodstuffs, plenty to eat. Well, ain't no trouble at all. Be glad of the company, too. <laughs> And I won't have to fight with heart all day. <laughs> and that'll be all right with me, too. If you're sure it won't be too much trouble, it'd be a great help. No, nope, no trouble at all. Well, if that's the case, what do you say we unload the car, boys? We can get a good night's sleep tonight and plan on starting for the mine early in the morning. It shouldn't take us long to get what we want. No, Willard. I don't think our job will be hard at all. Not hard at all. <laughs> Pleased with the success of their first step, the three men spend the early part of the evening talking of the mine, of Hayden's luck in hitting it rich, eagerly hanging on every word the old prospector says in hopes of locating his money cash. But although Hayden is willing to talk about his success, he is careful not to make any mention of what he has done with the money. At last, weary from the day's travel, they are making preparations for bed when Hayden's nearest neighbor, Tom Douglas, returning from Bow City and seeing the lights in the cabin, stops in to say hello. Well, hello, Tom. What are you doing, turning around this late at night? Well, I was coming in from the city, and I saw the lights in that car out there, so I thought I'd stop and see what's going on. Yeah. You got gas? Yep, yep. Come on in and meet him. Fellow used to work for me and a couple of mining engineers. Claim they want to look the old mine over. I guess they're the same ones I passed on the road this afternoon. I was wondering who they were. Well, well, come on in, shut the door. It's getting cold. Hello. Hello, this here is Tom Douglas. Leaves down the road a piece. This is Mr. Douglas from New York. How do you do? You know Hart and these two gents here, Dan O'Connell and Mr. Willard Dowdy, also in New York. Howdy, howdy. 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 You live around here long, Mr. Douglas? Oh, quite a while. Must be familiar with the Good Hope Mine, then. Mm -hmm. Know every inch of it besides. Good. I was thinking that maybe if somebody went along with us tomorrow, it would speed matters up. Of course, we were anxious to get our report and get back to New York. Maybe you could go with us in the morning, huh? Well, I suppose it could if it'd help any. Oh, it would. It'd be a great help. <laughs> following morning, true to his promise, Douglas shows up at the Hayden shack and picking the three men up, starts for the mine a few miles distant. Douglas makes a trip through the mine as fast as possible, picks up a few samples of ore and throwing all the samples into one big bag returns to Hayden. Once there, Douglas makes the excuse of talking to Hayden alone and Douglas leaves them, saying that he will return in the morning. And once he has left, Douglas calls his two cronies aside and explains his sudden hurry. I'm not sure, but I think that old coot Dugas suspects something. I didn't like the way he looked at me. Oh, what? So we've got to find that dough and get out of here. You find out anything from Dugas worth knowing? No. He says that Hayden hasn't got any dough, but I know different. The only thing that's bad is that we don't know where it is, and I don't think Hayden's liable to tell us. Yeah. What do we do? Tonight, after he and Hart have turned in, we'll do a little snooping. If it's in the house, maybe we can find it. And if we don't, then we stick around until we do. But that night goes by and the men find nothing. A day passes, two days, a week, and Douglas is frantic. Hayden and Hart are beginning to wonder why they don't leave, and Douglas realizes that the only way to find the money is to get the two of them away from the place long enough for a thorough search. But how to do this? Then one night, just as Douglas is about to give up, old Tom Douglas stops in to say that he's going to bow himself. Hayden gives Douglas a list, thanks him, and says he'll be home in the morning if there's anything else. And the following mor morning, Douglas starts off for the city. But as he's about to pass the Hayden house, he notices an air of desertion about the place. The car is gone and the front door is locked. On closer investigation, he finds that Hayden's dog is locked inside the house, a fact that disturbs Douglas. His suspicions aroused, he returns to his car, drives to Bouse, and reports to Constable Joe Cavanaugh, the Bouse City Sheriff's Office. And you say that he never locks the dog in the house when he leaves? No, sir. He's got a long line. 
lane out in front, and he always ties the dog out there. And that ain't all. I couldn't find a note on his door, and he always leaves a note. A habit he's never missed doing. What about these three men you mentioned? Do you know anything about them? Mm, nothing more than I told you. Only I didn't trust any of them. And they didn't seem like mining engineers to me. Well, there's a chance that they might have all gone up the mine, of course. Tell you what you do. If you find the same condition when you get back there tonight, drive up to the Swansea mine and pull me in. I'll get a couple of men and come out. Hey, ain't going to no mine. I know it. I know good and well something's happened over there, and I don't like it. Well, you call me if you need me, and I'll come out. Meantime, there's nothing more to do. All right, Constable, I'll go back now. But you stick around here. I got a hunch you'll hear from me sooner than you expect. And that night, the phone in Constable Cavanaugh's office suddenly jangled. And the voice of Tom Dugas informs him that there's still no sign of anyone at the Hayden house. Telling Dugas to go back to his place, Cavanaugh immediately wires Sheriff J.C. Hunter in Yuma and notifies him of the development. The sheriff replies that deputies Jack Livingston and Bob Cowie are on their way to Bowles. Next morning, when Livingston and Cowie arrive, Cavanaugh gives them the rough details of the case as they drive out to Hayden's ranch. Arriving, they find the place deserted. With the exception of the vines from a dog inside the house, there is no sign of any living thing. After picking up Dugas at his house, the three officers return and begin the search for Hart and Hayden. I guess the best thing to do is try and get in the house. They might be in there. Well, if they are, to think they're dead. They would have heard us pounding on the door. There's a screen window around on the side. Let's go on in that way. Right. Yeah, here it is. I guess this knife of mine will do the trick. You can stand on this box and reach it, I think. Yeah, that's it. Now. Yeah, that did it. Now, if you can give me a boost, I'll go through. Hey, wait a minute, Joe. I'm smaller than you are. Let me go in. Maybe that would be better. <laughs> I don't want to get stuck in there. All right, come on, give me a boost, will you? I can't make much sense out of all this, Constable. Looks like a wild goose chase to me. Well, we'll know in a minute. Find anything, Cowie? No sign of anybody. Just a foot here. Hey, wait a minute. What's up? Hey, looks like there's been a pretty kind of drop of turkeys out in here. Everything's been shoved around. Drawers all over. Well, that puts a different light on things. Cowie, see if you can unlock the front door from inside. I want to take a look myself. When Livingston and Cavanaugh enter the house, they find chaos. Strewn all over the front room floor are letters, empty drawers, pieces of clothing, with the lining ripped out. Dugas, eager to be of assistance, checks over Hayden's personal things. Finds that Hayden's shotgun, his 44 6 shooter, his overcoat and his hat are not to be found. Gathering his men about him, Deputy Sheriff Livingston analyzes the situation. Boys, it's easy to see that we're up against something pretty serious. There's nothing much we can do until we produce the bodies of Hayden and Hart, or better yet, the fellows who did it. Sorry, you and Kavanaugh might take a look around the grounds to see what you can pick up. I want to get a few more things straightened out here with Dugas. If you find anything, let me know. All right, Sheriff. Come on, Kari. Let's get going. Okay. Now, Dugas, you can help me a lot. First of all, where did Hayden usually leave the notes you speak of when he left? Uh, up on that piece of tin hanging there on the front porch. Come on, I'll show you. You know, he never went away without leaving one, Sheriff. And that's what made me think that there was something funny in the first place. Well, from the looks of things, your suspicions were right. I'm afraid there's plenty wrong here. Yeah. Here you are. See, here on this nail? Yeah. Well, let's take a look behind this tin here. Maybe a note could have slipped up. Ah. Here's a piece of paper. A note? Yeah. Let's see what it says. Gone to about home tomorrow, maybe. That sign Hayden. That ain't from Hayden. No? No. I know it ain't. But he wouldn't say maybe. He was always sure about what he was going to do and when he was going to do it. Anyway, 
Daddy, he's right. Well, I guess that pinches it. The house search, both men missing, and a forged note. Pretty conclusive evidence. Yeah, what are you going to do about it, Sheriff? he will go back to Bowes and send some telegrams. Meantime, I'll get Cowie to look for tire tracks from the car you say these fellows had. Working against time, realizing that every second counts, Livingston leaves Cowie to check tire tracks while he, Cavanaugh, and Dugas hurry back to Bowes. There is sent out a telegraph description of the car and the three fugitives. This done, he drives on to Yuma to make his report, leaving Dugas in the company of another deputy, George Cartwright, to return to the Hayden house to carry on the search. The next day at the deserted shack, the two men start a minute inspection of the ground. If those dirty bums wanted to get rid of a couple of bodies, it, it strikes me they'd bury them somewhere. And if they did that, well, there's bound to be some signs of it. Yeah, all we got to do is find those signs. Quite a job with a thousand square miles of desert and mountains to hide them in. Hey, wait a minute. Yeah? Look over there. Sir, sir, say, come on. Uh, mountain freshly turned dirt. You think it? Uh, come on, we'll get a shovel and start digging. If it's what I think it is, we won't have to look any further. later, a shovel wielded by Cartwright hits something in the soft earth. A little more digging and the body of Jack Hayden, the missing prospector, lies before the two men, a shotgun wound in the back of his head. Looking around, Cartwright finds another patch of fresh dirt, unmistakably the final resting place of Hayden's partner, Ralph Hart. The corpus delicti has been established, but the murderers are still missing. Cartwright and Douglas rush to Bowes and excitedly tell Constable Cavanaugh of their discovery, who in turn wire Sheriff Hunter in Yuma and ask that men be sent out at once to hold an autopsy and carry on the investigation. Within 12 hours, under Sheriff Ingalls, in company with Deputies Livingston, Robinson, and Dr. Reese, Yuma County physicians, arrive in Bowes, pick up Cavanaugh, and proceed to the scene of the murder. An autopsy of the body discloses that both Hayden and Hart died of gunshot wounds. Hayden, by a blast in the back of the head, Hart by two rounds, one in the right shoulder blade and one in the mouth. The next day, Livingston reports to the sheriff in Yuma. Well, what's the first thing? I'm not just sure, but I've got a mighty good idea that those three fellows will try to peddle the guns they stole from Hayden the first chance they get. Now, obviously, our first move is to notify all establishments in the state that might buy guns. Tell them to be on the lookout for anything answering the description of the missing one. You'd better get on that right away, Ingalls. Right. I'm hoping to get some answers in the description that I sent out of the getaway car. The since they couldn't have had time to get very far before the description was out. If they try to get out of the state in that car, we'll have them. Yeah. If they don't ditch the car and steal another one, that's what I'm afraid of. Wait a minute. I'll see what this is. Hello? This is Deputy George Phoenix Sheriff's Office. Oh, yeah. Yeah, what's up, Judge? just received word from a fellow here in Phoenix. Good. You got this fellow there? Uh, yeah, yeah. Name's Devin. Says he knows where these guys were heading for. Oh, what a break. Go on, go on, Georges. I'm listening. He heard them saying something about running the cash for bus tickets. And he's pretty sure he heard them mention Tucson. Great. See if you can dig up anything else on it, and I'll get in touch with Tucson immediately. If they did go there, we'll undoubtedly be able to find someone who saw them. I'll check with you later. Swell, and thanks a million, Georges. This is a real help. Okay, goodbye. Goodbye. With lightning-like speed, Sheriff Livingston checks with the Tucson police. Receives word that three men answering the description had left the bus at Tucson and transferred to a stage bound for New York City. On the strength of this news, the New York police are notified and requested to be on the lookout for the killers. And three days later, a telegraph message flashes 3,000 miles across the continent to Sheriff Hunter, Yuma, Arizona. Have two of three suspects in custody. Admit to names Doughty and O'Connell. Third suspect's whereabouts unknown. Can you find address Douglas's wife here? If so, please notify us. Chief of Police, New York City. Chief of Police, New York City. Have located Lou Douglas's brother. Says last known address, Mrs. Douglas, 58 East 125th Street, New York City. 
Appreciate your cooperation. Signed, Sheriff Hunter, Yuma, Arizona. And in response to this message, Detective Maloney of the New York Detective Force, in company with two officers, stop outside the door of a room at 58 East 125th Street, New York. Oh, we don't want to take any chance with this lad if he's still here. I'll go in first, and if he starts anything, let him have it. Right. Okay, here goes. Yeah? Is Mr. Lowe Douglas living here? What is to you? Well, nothing much. I I just wanted to have a little talk with him if he was around, that's all. Well, he don't live here anymore, so you might as well scram. Yes, I suppose so. Well, uh... Stop that gun, Douglas. Stop it, I say. <coughs> Here's a nice pair of bracelets for you. Uh, yeah, that's better now. So you thought you'd let us have a slugger to wait, Douglas? What's this all about anyway? I haven't done nothing and my name's not Douglas. I know, I know. Your name's John Smith. And you want to see your attorney. All right, boys. Let's take Mr. Smith for a little tour of the tomb. Once lodged in the city jail, the man denies any knowledge of the crime, denies he is Lou Douglas, denies everything, but he is quickly identified. And when confronted with the proof, admits he is Douglas, but claims he is innocent of any crime. Notified of his arrest, Sheriff Hunter obtained extradition papers, proceeds at once to New York, and with the three men in his custody, returns to the Yuma County Jail. They are placed in separate cells and not allowed to communicate with one another. And it is while they are locked in their individual cells that they make the biggest mistake. A mistake that brings a trustee to Sheriff Hunter's office with news. What is it, Neil? I thought you'd want to see this note, Sheriff. Note? Yes, sir. It's from one of those three fellows mixed up in that Hayden murder. All right, let me have it. Yes, sir. Hmm. From Douglas, huh? Yes, sir. He he says, say, Bill. You must say at the trial that I acted awfully crazy on the day of the murder. I will do all I can for you. And it's signed Lou. <laughs> Very interesting. I wouldn't be a bit surprised if this little piece of paper wouldn't hang the man who wrote it. And on the morning of September 18th, 1933, Lou Douglas... Willard Doughty and Dan O'Connell faced the angry mob in the crowded Yuma courtroom to stand trial on a murder charge. As a result of the incriminating note he had written, Douglas changes his plea to guilty but claims he acted in self-defense. However, the jurors are not swayed by this resort, and on the fifth day of October, less than a month after the trial had begun... Lou Douglas, you have been found guilty of first-degree murder. Have you anything to say before I sentence you? It was self-defense. Lou Douglas, after hearing the evidence offered in this case, it is the belief of this court that you are guilty of deliberately murdering two men. <clears throat> Therefore, it's my duty to sentence you to be executed in the lethal chamber at the state prison in Florence. And may God have mercy on your soul. No, Judge, it ain't right. You can't gas me. You can't do it. They moved the prisoner, baby. They didn't do it. It was self-defense. You can't gas and die for that. It ain't right. Willard Doughty and Dan O'Connell, you have been found guilty of murder in the second degree. Do you wish to make any statement before this court passes sentence on you? No, sir. No. Very well. Because of certain evidence submitted that shows that you, O'Connell, were the least guilty of this crime, I sentence you to five years in the Florence Penitentiary. And may this serve to teach you the futility of trying to break the law. Will it doubt you? I'm going to be more severe with you. You are a menace to society and deserve worse than I can give you. However... It is the sentence of this court that you shall spend the next 25 years of your life in confinement at Florence Penitentiary. Arizona leads all the states in per capita consumption of Rio Grande cracked gasoline. Arizonians have learned that Rio Grande's patented cracking process produces a gasoline that gives greater power, speed, and mileage than other brands selling at the same price. 
And in driving their engines at high speed over long distances in desert heat, Arizonians have learned that there is one motor oil which never breaks down. That Sinclair motor oil. And you can get it in tamper-proof cans wherever Rio Grande cracked gasoline is sold. Because all wax and petroleum jelly is extracted from Sinclair motor oils, they never get thin or watery at high speeds or blistering heat. Your car won't use so much oil when it runs on Sinclair because the parts that burn into carbon so easily are already removed. You get a really pure oil that never fails to give adequate lubrication. This month, we especially want everyone to go into a Rio Grande station and ask for a copy of the new double size Calling All Cars News. You'll enjoy reading the true detective mysteries, the police, movie, and radio news. And every boy and girl will want to read about Rio Grande's junior police department and the 15 valuable free gifts. Ask for your free copy wherever Rio Grande cracked gasoline is sold. Attention all Yuma County Sheriff's cars. A cancellation broadcast 133. Suspects in this case are now in the penitentiary. That's all.